Welcome to Blue White Tailgate. One of the great stories in the NFL and all of sports is Devin Still. We'll hear from him later. Penn State getting blown out on homecoming weekend. Are you kidding me? Well, as Trey tries to recover from that, we're going to also hear from Coach Franklin and find out how does he respond to a loss and the message that he gives to his players. All that and more coming up on the Blue White Tailgate. And we welcome you to Blue White Tailgate, presented by Coors Light, Steve Jones, Trey Bauer, Todd Sadowski. Great to have you with us. It may be a bye week for everybody with their feet up. Not for us. We are working right. individuals. Right. Back from his big Emmy Award after last week. <laughs> All right, so we have to start out with this question. Now, obviously, you have to give credit where credit's due. Northwestern, to its credit, played really, really well. But we have to discuss what went right, what went wrong. So what went wrong? Uh, what went wrong was I think that we kind of underestimated Northwestern. I think that we really kind of thought that, well, we're 4-0, and we're starting to kind of believe what people have been saying all along, you know, that they're 4-0 and, and maybe they're going to win 9-10 games. And I think when that happens, you kind of lull yourself to sleep and you can't, you just, can't, you, you got to just not listen to the banter. Yeah, to piggyback on that point, it's about how, t how many times do the coaches say, we want to focus on this game. We want to focus on this game. And as Trey mentioned, sometimes you get beyond the game as a player. Look, these are teenagers, 18-year-old to 21, 22, 23-year-old guys that maybe are buying into some of that hype. And really just execution. I mean, we're going to talk a lot about execution, too. It just was, it was poor on the offensive side of the ball. They just could not execute. Yeah, when it comes to execution, a lot of people have looked at this show and have said that about me. All right, so <laughs> let's talk about home invasions. Well, Northwestern walked in, and this is what happened to Penn State, the 23-point loss. Now, again, this, you know, it's interesting how it plays out at the end. This is a one-score game going into the fourth quarter, to start the fourth quarter. But you can see what the numbers and how they played out. So let's get to Frankly Speaking, brought to you by Blaze Alexander Family of Dealerships. James Franklin on dealing with his first loss at Penn State. I, I take full responsibility. We weren't ready to play today. Um, Really, in, on offense and defense, thought, thought we you know, could have played a lot better, made a lot of mistakes. You know, we're having the same issue, keeps popping up all year long, which is being able to consistently be able to run the ball um, and, and being able to protect the quarterback. So the bye week couldn't come at a better time. Trey, we always talk about correctable. Okay, we made errors, they're correctable. Can they fix it? Uh, I hope they can fix it. I don't think that they can. I mean, the fact is you can correct mistakes that are made, but if, if you're lacking in talent and you're lacking in experience, there's really nothing you can do about that. All right, so Todd, now for the first time at Penn State, we get to watch James Franklin in bounce back. Mode. Absolutely. We've seen him with wins. We've seen him before the season, energetic, upbeat. I think he's going to continue to stay that way. That's the way the man is built. But we're going to see the message that he gives to his players and see how the guys respond and see how they bounce back. We will get this fixed. I, I promise you and guarantee you that we will get it fixed. James Franklin was emphatic after his first setback. He was also diplomatic. I want to give all the credit in the world to Northwestern. They were the better team today. Uh, well coached, played hard, didn't make a whole lot of mistakes. So number one, you got to give those guys credit. Despite the loss, he was able to stay somewhat pragmatic. Let's be honest, we haven't played pretty really all year long, and it, it caught up to us. It caught up to us today against a good, solid, well-coached, hard-nosed team. Finally, from the coach, he's well aware the offensive line is problematic. Yeah, there's no doubt with Christian, we want to limit the hits on him, and he's taking way too many hits right now. Um, we we got to get that resolved. We got to get the running game going, and we got to be able to protect our quarterback. Coach Franklin cut his comments short and made one more promise to get it fixed. He'll be happy to know his team is anxious to work on that solution. 
best thing to get a loss out of your system is getting a win, getting back out there. But, um, you know, obviously going into a bye week, I, I just think we have to uh, be critical of ourselves, learn from our mistakes, but not get too down. Just, you know, kind of stay head steady. Uh, can't get too high, get, can't get too low. It all goes for all 11, you know, from top to bottom. It's not really just, you know, just one person to blame or point the finger at. We just know that we got to keep things rolling when we do have the momentum. You know, there was a, about a one-minute play in the game or about one minute within the game, guys, that really kind of, to me, said everything about the game. It's third and ten for Northwestern. They're up 7 nothing in the first quarter. Perfect back shoulder throw from Simeon to Jones for the first down. They get the touchdown. They make it 14 to nothing, And then they get the ball back. Grant Haley makes a bad decision, brings the ball out. They can't get the first down, 17-yard punt after Hackenberg was sacked. That kind of just said everything. Northwestern was there to play, to execute and Penn State was just flat. All right, so let's check out the road ahead now as to what the Nittany Lions have coming up. This is the road ahead, and it's two games in October, then the five-game stretch in November. All right, so now we get to, upon further review, our good friend Fran Fisher steps in. With the lifting of the sanctions and the prospect of a bowl game for the 2014 Nittany Lions looming, oh, I know, I know, not doing as much looming as last week, but that's another story. Anyway, I got to thinking about my bowl visits. I have been to 28 bowl games at 13 different venues. Now, I don't mean this as a boast, rather as a testament to the family football environment here at Penn State. Joe Paterno, Bob Scantle, and Jim Tarman made sure that I, as a broadcaster, and later as an administrator, was part of that family. And that included my wife, Charlotte, and on a couple of occasions, my sons, Jeff and Jerry. Every bowl game was memorable, like the two national championships, but I don't have time to do 28 memory bits. Forgive me if I get a little personal about the 1971 Cotton Bowl trip. You see, it was Charlotte's first airplane ride, a real white knuckler for her on the way to Dallas. But she became a veteran air traveler on the way back. Enough personal stuff. About the game, I have to say that 30 to six victory over Texas and Darrell Royal's vaunted wishbone offense was responsible for a collection of raised eyebrows among the national media and added considerable credibility to the Nittany Lions college football stature, perhaps more than any other Penn State victory. Okay, onward and upward. Time to be thinking about feasting on fresh Wolverine meat. <laughs> we sure don't want to save Brady Hook's job. For WHVL's Blue White Tailgate Show, this has been Upon Further Review. I'm Fran Fisher. Thank you, Fran. Joe Paterno back then was the offensive coordinator and the defensive coordinator. He called everything back then. He came up with the wishbone look on defense that stopped the wishbone look on offense. All right. I mentioned offense at the end. That's where we go next. We'll talk about the Nittany Lion offense with the team on Blue White Tailgate. Rough day all the way around for the offense. And, uh, okay, you look at defense. What was Northwestern doing? Uh, I, I think they played really solid. I don't think they did anything spectacular. Um, but, I mean, football is all about blocking and tackling. And if you can't control the line of scrimmage on either side of the ball, you're going to have problems. All right, interesting. What did you say? I saw 15 rushing yards up yeah. until the end, right? Up until the end. They got 35 towards the end when it was really the game was decided in the fourth quarter. I mean, do, you just, I mean, James Franklin always talks about you double your playbook when you can run the ball. Yeah. What we saw was a playbook that was cut in half, and you just can't get the job done. And then you got guys rushing at you. It's awfully tough to, to move the ball if you can't run it. Our drive of the game is brought to you by Stocker Chevrolet, located on the Benner Pike across from the Nittany Mall. Drive of the game actually starts with a punt return. It's the longest punt return in Jesse Gallo Valley's career, 41 yards. Previous best had been 31. That kind of gave everybody a little bit of juice. Dumped the ball off, and here comes Akeel Lynch. First reception of his Penn State career, 11 yards for Akeel. So, opportunity here for Christian Hackenberg on the rollout in the end zone, and Geno Lewis cannot reel it in. Cannot reel it in. Now they try it again, and then some people thought that might have been pass interference on that play, but no call. And then they throw back there, and there's the one right there that caused the frustration. 
Now, take one more look. And it, it's there, and it's right off the turf, and that would have gone for a long way, but it does set up the field goal by Sam Ficken that made it, at that point, a one-score game, and that's our Stocker Chevrolet drive of the game. Frust frustrating there at the end. You could just see, because he was comfortable and could throw the ball, he just skipped it off the turf. The little things add up, don't they? And if he yeah. leads him a little bit farther, gets him the ball out so he yeah. still catches him in stride, then maybe he can make a move to get that first down. Ball a little behind him, has to reach down, can't catch it, leads to more frustration, and you got to settle for the field goal. Really, it's a turning point. You get three out of that, and you really, you really ha had to have seven. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that you know we have to just remember that Christian Hackenberg is a sophomore. Sure. I mean, he's a young guy. Um, he doesn't have a lot of experience. I mean, everyone's thinking he's, you know, Joe Montana and whatever. It's like the guy's a sophomore, he's a young guy. He's he's bound to make mistakes, and that's okay. He's going to get better. But I think the I think the expectations are just a lot right now. All right, Deshaun Hamilton, by the way, is our family clothesline offensive player of the week. Six catches for 100 yards for Deshaun Hamilton in this one, including the longest reception of his career. This 51-yarder. Look at the adjustment on the ball that he makes. That ended up setting up a field goal for Penn State. This is his third 100-yard receiving game in the opening five games of his Penn State career for the redshirt freshman. And not the first time that we've seen him catch a ball in double coverage down the middle of the field. He did it earlier in the season as well. He's shown a propensity to go up and catch the ball at its highest point. And as a wide receiver, that's a pretty good skill to have. Yeah, it goes back to that 44-yard play where Penn State had that go-for-it mentality after they had received a penalty and got a first down. They, they, you know, also, they, they went for the bundle, got the 44-yarder set up a touchdown against Central Florida in Ireland, which seems like two years ago, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it? I mean, just it does. uh, that, that because it's of the length of time, it seems like. <laughs> All right, so the offensive line. We know that that is a focal point for everybody. James Franklin has been repeatedly asked about it. I know those kids care about this team and Christian Hackenberg and playing better um, than anybody. And I love those kids. Um, so we got to get it fixed. We got to help them out. And that's going back to fundamentals and, and, and those types of things. Okay, I want to make a quick point to each of you and I'll get you to react to it. Uh, and sanctions, you know, people want to know oh, sanctions. Sanctions play a role. Because okay, you're right now, you're you're 14 scholarships down from everybody else. Because Anthony Stanko still counts. Okay, if you look at how Christian Campbell's put in the game, he's put in the game at corner with three veterans. When Marcus Allen comes in the game at safety, there are three veterans. Gary Wooten comes in the game; he's flanked by veterans. Idealistically, you'd love to shape your offensive line by putting Brendan Mann or Gaia or or Nelson in the game with veterans to help them out, and they don't have that luxury. Am I far off on this? Yeah, you're absolutely spot on. I mean, it, you, can't, you, you can't create um, experience. You have to have experience, and the guys have to be able to um, have that opportunity, and, and, and if they don't have it, you can't just recreate, like, or create experience. Right. Well, and momentum's a real thing when yeah. you're out there on the field. And if sure. you're struggling and you're trying to find answers, who do you go to? You can't look to the coach from the huddle and he can talk to you there. Not everybody's wearing a headset. He can't just talk to you. You look to the guys that have the experience, that have been there. Yeah. What do we do about this situation? Did you see what that defensive lineman just did to me? And instead, now they're looking at each other going, yeah, I know. I don't know. I don't know what to do at this particular point. So it's about figuring out as you go along. And you really, it's nice to have somebody to refer to in those situations. All right, now the next part is distribution of the football. Andrew Callista takes a closer look at how Penn State distributed the ball in the passing game. So, Penn State has issues. Not a shocker, we've all seen them. But the smoke and mirrors of winning has kept complaints at bay. But it's time to look a little closer at some of the struggles in the passing game. Hitch, slant, out, all outside the hash marks and pretty much sums up the Penn State passing tree. Don't believe me? Let's look at the facts. Fact, Penn State threw 46 passes against Northwestern. Fact, 70% were within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. Fact, a staggering only nine passes went between the hash marks. Two were completed and one was picked off. We want to limit the hits on him and he's taking way too many hits right now. Um, we, we got to get that result. We got to get the running game going and we got to be able to protect our quarterback. With no running game, you got to be creative. Some screens. Right now, Penn State only runs the center screen. And against the Cats, that skipped off alignment. Can you throw the ball downfield with a weak line? 
Absolutely. Northwestern did. Four wide attack. Tight end seams. Ball gone in under three seconds. 20 yards each time. And oh yeah, they utilized the middle of the field. Something Penn State refuses to do. We go out there, we get a feel for what the defense is doing on our first drive. We take what they give us, really, and then when the shots, you know, present themselves, we, that's when we usually take it. Against UCF, the shots came early and the offense rolled. Rutgers, it took till the second half for the shots downfield to come, and it showed. Coordinators are figuring out, with no reason to back off, DBs are sitting on these routes. And linebackers have no reason to respect the middle with no one crossing their face. Something has to change. Andrew Calista for Blue White Tailgate. Pretty thought-provoking stuff right there. Obviously, the run game kind of dictates what you can do with the passing game. Look, this was less than five yards per attempt that Penn State had in the passing game. Something is going wrong, and in my opinion, we got to find these tight ends across the middle. And I mean, we're throwing to them, but when they're double covered or low or a little high, it's just that connection has got to be made. That will free up more success on the outside, but they got to get those 10-yard passes across the middle. Yeah, they, that's where you can create a mismatch mm -hmm. just on pure hype. The screen part of it that Andrew brought up, how much does a running game help a screen pass? Well, screen passes aren't going to work if you don't have a running game. If you're going to throw the ball 24 times in a row like we did, I mean, you can screens are not going to work if you can't run the ball, period. And, of course, then the other part, too, is you got to get a little bit more out of the return game. Grant Haley and the return game struggled just a bit. Couple of uh, The one choice in particular coming out eight yards deep, tough. Getting another field goal block, that's two this year. So whatever he's been able to get the ball past the line of scrimmage, he's made one. So defense next. All right, got off to a slow start, then hit stride. We'll talk about them as we continue on Blue White Tailgate. Welcome back. I'd like to point out if I knew the answers, I would not be sitting in this chair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd be sitting in another chair someplace else. <laughs> All right. Let's get to uh, the defense. Tempo was important in a game like this, guys. And when you look at Northwestern, they scored you know, twice in their first three drives. So, Trey, let's take it from, you, from your vantage point. Once they get used to the tempo, they shut them down. But how, you know, getting used to a tempo, what does that take, especially early in game? Well, I think there is a momentum. There's positive momentum in games and there's negative momentum in the game, right? So I think defensively, once you get a few stops, you know, you kind of, it builds up on itself, you know, confidence-wise. And, um, you know, I, I just think that, I think they played well the whole year, quite yeah. frankly. And they gave up with the four, the 14. I yeah. mean, any early, and then that's it. I mean, because yeah. you look at the fourth quarter, that's a pick, that's a fumble, that's right. a, a short drive because you take over and downs. They actually play pretty well. Right, and I think that the early rush is it was where you tip your cap yeah. to Northwestern and say, look, yes. they came out with a good game plan. Uh, the coaching staff had faced Coach Franklin's coaching staff when they played against Vanderbilt, so they were familiar with some of the schemes. They able to look at some of the film. They came out with a good game plan, and Simeon executed them, and the guy did a good job. As we tip your cap, he gave up a few points in the first quarter, something they hadn't done all year long. You know, that was not going to continue. We were going to give up a point or two in the first quarter at some point. Made the adjustment. It's just the other side of the ball. Just They kept giving the ball back to Northwestern, and you start to, start to wear down a little bit. Family Clothesline Defensive Player of the Week is Mike Hall. 16 tackles in this game. He now has 53 on the year and just always in great position. There's the fake field goal by Christian Salem, and he and Trevor Williams shut that down. It's all part of what Mike Hall is able to do. Look, I mean, the pressure. See, this when they when they got away from the four-man rush and dialed up pressure, they really – Simeon started out 10 of 12 in this game. Then after that, he was under the Mendoza line the rest of the game in terms of where he was throwing the football. And, but they didn't have Naeem Wartman. So what's the impact of that on an outside linebacker? And did we see the tight end or, or super back become more effective? Well, I, I think what happens is when you have a, a guy who, who's a good player like that, and, and we've talked about this from the beginning, that you know, we, have, we, have, we, we, Penn State, does not have a lot of depth. And when you lose a, a first-string guy like that, it puts a lot of pressure on everybody else. All right, now let's get to the next issue, and that's Mike Hall talking about no Naeem Wartman. Uh, we missed him a lot. You know, he's a big part of our defense. Uh, he does great in pass coverage and uh, takes away those seam throws most of the time, which uh, you don't really recognize uh, until he's not in there. Yeah, 
and we saw a little bit of that. Vaughn Walker and the freshman Jason Cabinda play for the first time in this one, but now let's get to tackling, consistent tackling. How did James Franklin view that? And then on defense, I thought overall we played solid, but we did not tackle as well as we've tackled in previous weeks. We were throwing shoulders, not wrapping up, things like that. That's yeah, interesting, his take on that. Yeah, absolutely. And look, we identified a couple of positions at the beginning of the year. We've talked about the offensive line. The linebacking core was the other one where they didn't have a lot of depth. So you lose a Wartman, and all of a sudden, the pressure is going to be on the other guys. And we mentioned Walker and Kaminda. But I want to throw it over to Trey here and talk about the tackling issue. Look, sometimes it's going to happen. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. But just from what you saw, what was going on with the guys, and, and what are the things that you just continually drill at guys when it comes to the tackling issue? Well, there was a guy who that I, um, I played for, and his name was Joe Sarah. Yep. And Joe Sarah said, tackling is simply feet and courage, period, end of story. You bring your feet, you bring your courage, um, and, and that's what makes someone a good tackler. And of course, you have to practice it. I, how much are they practicing tackling during the week? I don't know. I mean, you've got a light squad, scholarship-wise guys, not a lot of depth. I mean, they may not be tackling in practice. I, I, I don't know. I haven't been out there. Yeah. It's emphasized. There's no question about that. It's, it's emphasized. But, you know, I see tackling across the board in the NFL and even in college football. A lot of shoulders being thrown in these yeah. days. Yeah, not a lot of rapid. This is across the board. I don't mean Penn State. All right. One thing Northwestern did, though, is they did slow down that four-man rush for Penn State. Austin Johnson and what happened there. We were just trying to push the po I was just trying to push the pocket just so uh, he didn't have anywhere to rush and if CJ or Deion got free or anything like that then they could make the sack or if I like messed up his uh, throwing motion or just impact the play. And that's key. I mean, if you can get a rush with four, Todd, that changes a lot of things. They had to blitz a lot more. You know, it's funny because I would imagine a lot of the teams that we faced have had a lot of these discussions in their analysis shows when they faced Christian Hackenberg and Penn State. You know, what happened? Could we get some pressure in his face when we've had successful days? And I think, you know, the, the Northwestern's offense did a really good job. It affected. They got rid of the ball quickly. It was a little bit harder to get to the pressure this particular week. So you, you put this one aside for the defense and you keep doing what you're doing. One of the great defensive players ever here is going through a very tough time that has actually galvanized the sports world. We'll talk to Devin Still after this. A tenacious player on the field while at Penn State and a great father off the field. Welcome back to the Blue White Tailgate Show. Happy to be joined right now by former Penn State All-American and current Bengal, Devin Still. Devin, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Most important question, Devin, how is your daughter Leah doing right now? She, she's doing real well. Um, she's recovering from her surgery and she's bouncing back uh, pretty strong. Um, as I told everybody before, she's uh, a trooper. And um, just seeing the way that she's able to continue to keep a smile on her face and work through her different rehabs to bounce back from her surgery is really encouraging. So glad to hear that. You talked about keeping a smile on her face. The pep talk that you gave her in the car on the way to CHOP, what was going through your mind? And I mean, it, it's a viral video. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, you. Um, the night I'm before, she was real nervous um, about her surgery. About and I tried you. to show her Let's like different it. scars that I had on my Let's body go. from uh, football-related surgeries. But when we woke up in the morning, she was still a little bit nervous as we was driving there. So I wanted to do something that could put a smile on her face and get her to stop wearing it. And I noticed she loved the camera. So I just turned on my video and I just recorded uh, me talking to her. I didn't know it was going to go as viral as it did as soon as I put it up. It was just something to put a smile on her face. Well, you did play for some great coaches while you were here at Penn State and when you were younger. So motivational speaking, you definitely have a career in that once the football days <laughs> are over but how has this part of your life put sports in perspective for not only you but everyone in the Cincinnati Bengal locker room as well you know as far as it goes with sports that's that's all it was to me it was a sport and um it's it's shown me throughout this whole process that how much of an impact that the sports world has on the real world and uh to see fans from all over and just people who want to step up and make a difference 
in this world support this cause as much as they have thus far with uh, purchasing jerseys uh, where the proceeds go to pediatric cancer research and people signing up for the pleasure campaign. Uh, it, it's just been amazing. And the Bengals have definitely stood by my side since I let them know what my daughter was going through. Devin, there's been so much negativity, specifically in the NFL recently, but this story has truly touched everyone. Has anything surprised you about this story, whether it was how the Bengals, an NFL organization, treated you, Coach Payton reaching out and purchasing 100 jerseys, or even Coach Kelly with the gift basket? I think it's two things that really stuck out to me. Uh, one is definitely um, what the Bengals are doing because, as everybody knows, the NFL is, is based off performance and it's based off what you can do on the football field. And it's kind of, before to me, it was kind of a, a roof of the sport. And uh, just seeing at the heart that everybody in the Bengals organization from different NFL teams has been showing uh, throughout this whole process has been truly amazing. And just my faith in mankind has been restored because when you look on TV and you look at the news, all you hear is about negative stories happening all over the country and all over the world. And to see people step up the way they have and show the heart that we have as uh, hum humans, it, it definitely it restored my faith. Over 10,000 jerseys sold, over a million dollars raised. Whose idea was it to get that promotion going? And are you surprised that your jersey was the fastest selling jersey ever in the history of the Bengals? It was definitely the Bengals' idea. I, I had no idea that they were starting it. I actually found out on Twitter uh, that they started selling my jersey. And that just shows how the Bengals organization is stepping up and trying to support not only my family uh, through this, but other families who are battling the same thing. It definitely surprised me uh, how the jerseys just flew off the rack as fast as they did. Then again, that's people stepping up for a, a positive cause. Like you said, there's a lot of negative things going on in the NFL right now. And this is one of the bright spots, and people are attracted to it. Devin, being at Penn State and having Thawne such a central part of the Penn State experience, how, looking back, does maybe that change your thoughts about Thawne and maybe make you appreciate Thawne even more for what those kids here at Penn State and yourself did while you were here? Participating in Thawne, I knew what we was participating for. Being on the outside and not having somebody in my family that's going through cancer, I really didn't get the full emotion of what families go through uh, when they're battling cancer. And just me being in this situation now with my daughter fighting cancer, it definitely makes me appreciate Don that much more because they're helping out a lot of families and uh, children as I am uh, as trying to fight uh, cancer. While you were at Penn State and Coach Paterno, he always liked to preach about life after football. Do you appreciate that even more now? Uh, I appreciate it then. Um, I've seen myself, I saw myself grow so much from when I was an incoming freshman to when I was graduating and to the man I became now. And I give all the credit to Coach Paterno and the Penn State staff for, for molding me into the young man that I am today. Devin, if you could, for all the viewers out there, could you direct us where they'd be able to purchase the jerseys and uh, Devin, the Devin Still t-shirts that are also being sold out there to help your daughter Lee? Right. If you, you go to the BengalsProShop.com, uh, they have my jerseys on sale there until October 20th. Like we said before, 100% of the proceeds go to pediatric cancer research. And I also have another website that is uh, CincySearch.com where you can purchase jerseys, I mean shirts, for families who can't afford $100 jerseys, those shirts range from about $25 and 15 of those dollars go to cancer research also. And then we also have uh, a pledge uh, with Scott Shirley from Penn State, and they can go to pldgit.com. And what they do there is they can make a one-time donation or they can make a donation based on uh, the amount of sex we had to have as a defensive unit this year. Devin, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. You are one of Penn State's favorite sons, a true Penn Stater, and we can't wait to have you back here. All right, thanks for having me. Thanks, Devin. Coming up next, Todd Sadowski joins me on set, and we talk recruiting.
Some good looking video right there. We are back on the blue white tailgate to talk about recruiting sponsored by Central PA Doc and Door. That means we bring in Andrew Callista to talk about the recruiting. And there's some local kids people are keeping an eye on. Who are they? Well, let's start with Allentown, the fans down there. Saquon Barkley, my favorite Zephyr since the Red Hot Chili Peppers song. The kid is just tearing it up on the field. Rushed for 158 yards versus Parkland. Parkland has a very good football team this year, by the way. Two touchdowns and, oh, two more through the air, Todd. Doubling up the Zephyr QB in yards, 142 to 75. Stop the presses. Penn State found its Wildcat back for the next four years. James Franklin will be running that all game long. 17 TDs on the year, close to 1,000 yards on the ground coming into this week. And for the folks in Harrisburg on your station, Fox 43, Todd, Andre Robinson still out with that ailing lower leg injury. But so far, the first game of the year did average 8.3 yards per carry. Two TDs against Teal High. Has 65 career touchdowns, over 4,300 career rushing yards should be back soon, or we're expecting them to be back soon for the Crusaders as they get ready for the playoffs. Right, we always love to highlight the skills, guys. They get the job done. How about up in the trenches? Obviously, that's where we need some help. Where is it coming from? Well, we have Ryan Bates from Archbishop Wood. Big news with Sterling Jenkins. He tweeted out that he's on track to enroll early starting in January. That's huge, huge news for the staff. And Steven Gonzalez out of New Jersey's point for fans, what some people may not realize, on the two deep, there's only one scholarship player that's a senior. Two redshirt freshmen, one scholarship player on the two deep, but that's their situation with the scholarship reductions over the last three years. All right, obviously we're talking about depth issues and help is coming. It is going to take a little while, but those classes that are coming in are pretty highly rated, and we're going to get some help for Penn State and James Franklin and his staff. Some guys we may not see. Here is our Health South injury update. And of course, Naeem Wartman goes on to the list. We saw him on the sidelines in a sling, so we don't expect to see him. And uh, one of the guys on this list, though, Andrew may be coming off pretty soon. That's right. A couple weeks ago, we did see Miles Diffenbach at practice wearing pads on the sidelines. How much contact he was having, nobody knows. It's pure speculation on our part. There's rumors around the program, whether it's going to be Ohio State, whether he's going to come back for Maryland, but we'll see. Anyway, he's not eligible for a red shirt, so it's his benefit to play this year at Absol some point. Absolutely, and it, uh, by week comes at a good time for the guys that have been playing and also for him as well as we get a little bit more rest. Only two games coming up in the month of October for the team. That's right. Two weeks, huge. There's too many guys that are playing constantly. You guys pointed out Angelo Mangiro. He needs his bye week. He's always iced up after the game. Bye week's coming at a good time. Probably would have liked it to be a week earlier, but you get a bye week heading into Michigan, bye week before Ohio State. All right, Andrew Callista, thanks a lot. That's some recruiting news for you. We're going to be back here on the Blue White Table right after this. We'll talk with Frank Badani of the York Daily Record, and then we'll wrap things up with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Welcome back. Still to come, the fearless prediction segment. <laughs> fearless, I mean, really, there's nothing at stake, so of course it's fearless. And we're joined now by Frank Bodani from the York Daily Record. My good friend, great to hear from you. Hey, you too. I'm glad to be with you guys today. Good to hear from you, Steve. <laughs> All right, hey, Frank, uh, let's get to it. You know, they head into this off week. What On your checklist, what would you like to see in this off week that can make this a better team down the road? Well, I think, I guess basically what James Franklin talked about is, you know, some of the guys that have played so many snaps need to get a breather. And I think it probably comes at a good time for guys like Donovan Smith and Anthony Zettel, Austin Johnson, and, you know, like Angelo Mangiro. I mean, he played Saturday, but you could see his legs were wrapped with ice. We heard he was hobbling around before the game. So, I, you know, I think it'll help those guys. And then they need to come up with a way to scheme around their problems, I think, a little bit better. And I think the coaching staff at least has a little bit of time to do that now. And, Frank, uh, you know, Christian Hackenberg, what are some of the issues that you're seeing offensively out of Christian Hackenberg? Obviously, they've been able to move the ball down the field, but very few touchdown passes from Hackenberg to some of his receivers. So what's going on that you think they need to get him to get the ball to the receiver where they're getting six points out of the play? What's happening, in your opinion, with Hack? Well, I mean, to me, it just looks like he's not comfortable. So my thought is figure out a way to get Christian more comfortable in the passing game in the offense. And, you know, obviously everybody's picking on him because there's times where he has time and he's still – maybe not making the throws that people expect, but I just think that everything is kind of snowballed, built up on him. 
you know, mentally he might be trying to do too much, trying to hang on the ball and make a big play. I think they need to find ways for him to just get into a rhythm. Maybe, maybe it's shorter throws. You know, maybe it's rolling out the pocket more from the beginning of the game. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on that, but they need to figure out a way to be able to use his great tools, get him feeling like, okay, I can do this. It's, you know, not worrying about things. It almost looks like he's worrying about things out there. Now, Frank, I think there's been a point where maybe in the 80s and 90s, a group of us could sit down and go, you know, this will be a 20-point game, a 10-point game, a fourth-quarter game. How unpredictable because of the situation is this football team? Well, I think you hit on it is that they they rely on so many young players. So I think it's harder to figure out what's going to happen on any given Saturday when you're dealing with kids that are freshmen and sophomores and maybe they've played a couple of games, but they haven't played a whole season. So you maybe don't know what they're going to do. I mean, there's so many of them. And I, I don't think that in my 20 years, of covering Penn State football, have have I ever seen an offensive line this inexperienced? I mean, it has nothing to do with how good these guys could be in the future, but I mean, so much inexperience at a place that just, I mean, it, it needs it, it it needs repetition. So that's, you know, I think that hits on what you're saying with unpredictability too. And certainly in the Big Ten, Frank, the problems that Penn State have are not exclusive just to the Nittany Lions. They've got a lot of teams out there that are struggling. Um, look, October schedule is two games, two night games, and then five in November. So they're going to get a lot of rest here in the month. Uh, obviously, that's going to be important to them. But Michigan's in, in disarray. I mean, how do you see Penn State potentially playing things out as they get through October? They got Michigan, then they get some more rest for Ohio State. And then it's the kind of the, the five run at the five game run at the end. Yeah, I kind of look at the season in three parts. They just got done their first part of the season. Um, their second part, you know, to me is these two bye weeks along with Michigan and Ohio State. And I think they got to use the bye weeks as much to their advantage as possible to kind of be a transition from the beginning of the season, figure out what they've done wrong, what they can do differently, and then take that into the second half. So I guess we'll see how well they utilize this extra time. I mean, James Franklin did very well with his bye weeks at Vanderbilt in his three years. So we'll see what, what, you know, what his staff can, you know, can do now. I, I like looking back to um, 2001 with Penn state when they started 0 and four, their offense was struggling probably more than it is now. Couldn't score points. And they had a bye week before they played Northwestern. And it gave the coaching staff a little bit of time to regroup, come up with some different schemes, a different plan. And you could see how, you know, they really use that to their advantage. Yeah, went to the power eye, if I remember. Uh, yes. it, 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 you have a very passionate area, Frank, that you write in. How have the fans reacted to the 4-1 and one start, and in particular how they react to the loss on Saturday? You know, I, I look at the message boards, and I just think that, um, you know, fans were so excited about James Franklin coming into this that the 4-0 four and, four and oh start just fed that and I think got their expectations up a little bit. And I kind of understand because if you have this really, you know, what you think, great coach, young coach, lots of energy, great staff behind them, and they figured out a way to win four games with who they got, you just figure that it's going to keep rolling. So then on the other side of it, when they have a loss like this, you know, and you can't predict how you're going to lose and who you're going to lose to. But when they have a loss like this, I think it goes the other way. I mean, people just need to kind of settle down a little bit. But, you know, in this day and age, what do you expect? I mean, with social media, everything's instantaneous. People, you know, they dwell on what happens in the moment. And it's hard, I think, for people to take a step back. Frank, thanks so much. Frank Bodani, York Daily Record. We'll come back, wrap things up in a moment on Blue White Tailgate, presented by Coors Light. never just only a football game, Andrew. You understand? That was Jim Patrick from Lewisburg, who since 1952 has missed only one homecoming game, and that's because he changed jobs and moved to the West Coast. I also like the fact that he had the earphones on, so yeah. obviously he critiques Jack and me. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to listen to Jack. You got that right. <laughs> 
oddly enough, everybody says that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> All right, let's get to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Obviously, Todd's already taking care of the ugly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm throwing that away this week. I, I'm off that list. Yeah, you already tossed me under yeah, the bus. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> the good is... If they were 5-0, and oh, I would tell you it is awesome they're having a bye week. They're 4-1. and one. I'm telling you, it's awesome they have a bye week. <laughs> you get to go next. Yeah. Okay, the bad. A couple of things. First off, Pitt. Did you see what happened to them? They yeah. lost to Akron, a team that we handled pretty easily from a defensive standpoint. Lost to Akron <laughs> at home. That is not a good defeat for those guys. That's two in a row. And then the Michigan situation, you've been following that one. Uh, as Fran Fisher said, we do not want to save Brady Hoke's job. We want to pile on there when we face the Wolverines. Ugly. Um, okay. <laughs> getting blown out for homecoming. I mean, Jim Patrick, he was probably, he was probably thinking he probably should miss this one. <laughs> um, I, I don't even know what to say. It's been so long uh, for me to even think about uh, homecoming and being, it, it was always penciled in as a win. Like, you okay. just won on homecoming, that was the end of that, and that obviously didn't happen. All right, let's look around the top 25, because you know what? We move forward. <laughs> Oklahoma at TCU. Guys, thoughts, winners? Well, Oklahoma seems to be one of those yeah. top programs. I mean, they, they might be the representative out of the Pac-12 if anybody yeah. wants to come out of that conference and be part of the yeah. uh, Final Four later on. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think this is upset alert. Texas A&M at Mississippi State. Dan Mullen might have something going here. Yeah, he, he may have something going, but it's not this week. I mean, <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna, on the I'm Texas a different A&M page. is going to kill him. It's at Starkville. I just I got a feeling. It's with Starkville. It's not no, no, not have this ever, week. Have you ever been there? I don't know how to spell Starkville, but <laughs> they're not going to be Texas A&M at home. A, a biggest weekend. I know you're coming to it now. Biggest weekend for college football in the state of Mississippi. Yeah. In a long, long time. Ole Miss is right up there, too. Yeah, Vaught Hemingway Stadium, Ole Miss, Alabama. What do you think? I think that Mississippi State has a better chance to win than, than Ole Miss. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I will be rooting for Ole Miss to win that game, but I would think Mississippi State has a little better chance to knock off Texas A&M. I would think one of those two teams, okay. I'd like to see one, at least one of those two teams win, one of the Mississippi no, teams. No, that's not going to happen. Okay. Shut no. me down. Stanford, no. Notre Dame. <laughs> Um, I hope Stanford kills Notre Dame. I don't like Notre Dame. I didn't like them when we played. Um, all I know is we were we were we won four out of five against Notre Dame. So I'm concerned at the fact I don't. You're not strong enough in this segment. I, I just I don't like Notre Dame. <laughs> not mincing words. Is I'm he? still looking yeah. for the equipment guy right. to kick me in the head too. Right. Back in 1987. Okay, Everett Golson really good though. He's been really great. Good. He's been great. Okay, Michigan at Rutgers is the one we want to concentrate on when it comes to the Big Ten. I mean, that's a night game. They got Wisconsin, Northwestern, Ohio State, Maryland, Nebraska, Michigan State. Okay, very quickly, winners there. I'm going to go with Rutgers. I'm going to go with Wisconsin, Maryland, and Michigan State. Uh, I don't really care about any of those games. I do care about <laughs> I do care about Rutgers, and I think Rutgers is going to wax Michigan at home. It's be the biggest win they've ever had there. I want to see if they can recreate that environment that they had for Penn State. I mean, they were pretty jazzed. The fans were for that one. See if they can make that a, a good home field advantage against the Wolverines. I'd like to see Michigan win to get a little healthy and then stumble against us, but we'll see what happens. I don't know if they can put it together that quickly. I think Maryland's one of those teams you got to look out for. Their offense has been rolling a little bit and uh, we'll see what they can do that's their first Big Ten home game so we'll see what kind of environment they can create as Ohio State comes to town oh look for Rutgers this is their home schedule the best they've ever had so I mean this is this is what they have Michigan I've already done a quick breakdown of them because I've already started to do some advanced work minus 12 giveaway takeaway minus 12 wow. I mean that is an absolute crusher and offensively haven't generated a lot obviously in the past game they don't have a 200 yard passing game We'll actually have more on that next week. For Trey, Todd, I'm Steve. Thanks for joining us on the Blue White Tailgate presented by Coors Light.